Good evening, everybody, and welcome, welcome, welcome to another one of Rabbi Landis's fun-filled Tuesday night Zoom lectures. I welcome you all here. I hope you all had a great week. Good evening, What everybody. is that? And welcome, welcome, welcome to another one of Rabbi Landis's fun-filled Tuesday night Sorry. Zoom lectures. I know exactly I what that is. Here. I... That was again, that's always fun with our backup stream and I forgot to turn the sound off, so I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, uh, sorry for the delay here. We we had, it seems like, you know, inevitably every night or every other night or whatever it is, we have some sort of technical difficulty. Tonight we can blame it on, we can blame it actually on Facebook because Facebook wouldn't let our live stream start for some reason. And therefore, we are going to be streaming live tonight on YouTube. The link is posted on Facebook and all the places. Uh, so if you know someone who doesn't want to come into the Zoom room for whatever reason, would rather be on YouTube, they can watch tonight's class on YouTube. It'll be posted there afterwards as well. And I'll put the link in the chat box as well for anybody who would uh, want to share that or rather be on YouTube. But uh, Okay, so that's uh, that's our so to speak excuse for tonight. Um, I was hoping that Steve would be here so we could wish we could start by wishing him a very happy birthday. Steve hit the big seven zero yesterday, seventy, and uh, we wish him a very very happy birthday. If he ends up making here late, we'll wish it then. If if not, we'll wish him next week. But a very exciting birthday for Steve, and many many more to him and to Wendy, and they should have many more happy years together, and and all that good stuff. Uh, a few quick announcements. You're going to be receiving an email later tonight. You, you probably received one already, but you're receiving another one later tonight about the Shabbos Project. The Shabbos Project is happening again this year. Uh, even though there will be no in-person programming per se, there will be a slew of amazing virtual program and educational opportunities. Partners in Torah has actually taken on the Shabbos Project. It is now our responsibility. Uh, it is under our purview. And we are very lucky to have an amazing group of people helping us out with that. And the top of that list is our very own Joanne Davis right here, who is going to be the, the event chair for the Challah Bake together with Heather Green. And uh, a lot of awesome stuff coming for that. So to keep an eye on your inbox to see how to sign up and, and to see the website and to get more information about the Shabbos Project, it is in about three weeks, November 6th through 8th, and a lot of exciting stuff for that. So please, please, oh, there's the flyer right there for the virtual challah bake experience, which will be November 5th, and then followed by the Shabbos on the 6th and the 7th. And uh, that virtual challah bake will be featuring a lot of awesome stuff, again, uh, Joanne's going to be starring with Heather, and that's going to be really awesome, and some other great people, including, um, I, you know, I, I don't, I might get in trouble for a spoiler alert here, and Nomi will tell me later if I am, but my father will be talking about his Chal experience with my wife, Nomi, and it'll just be a really, really great program. So uh, check your email out and see all the exciting things coming with the Shabbos Project. With no further ado, let's jump into our queen for the evening. You've heard about queen for a day or king for a day. This is queen for an evening. Tonight, we are talking about the wicked queen Isabel, or Jezebel in English, uh, the power to build and destroy. Now, Jezebel is, is definitely a fascinating, fascinating character, as we shall soon see. And But uh, one thing I, I realized as I was preparing for tonight is that we, we have this opportunity to like, do a tour through Jewish history as it pertains to queens, because we started last week with, with uh, the queen, the, the uh, Pharaoh's daughter and uh, the Queen of Sheba. And we're going to be now moving on to, uh, you know, about 50 years after that. And we're going to be making our way through the first temple and the second temple. So in light of these queens that we're going to be covering, we'll be covering a lot of the chronological, chronological uh, story of Jewish history. But I, I do want to give the backdrop so we understand the world that Ezevel came into. And I'll assume that everyone's either here last week or roughly knows what we did last week. Last week, we essentially talked about the multitude of wives of King Solomon, of Shlomo HaMelech, most specifically uh, the daughter of Pharaoh and the Malka Shva, the Queen of Sheba. And what happens is, as a result of Solomon's failed policy, the kingdom was essentially split. It was basically destroyed, but not really destroyed. It was split because his son takes over, continues these bad policies, and the kingdom is split into two. 
So if you've ever heard when referring to the first commonwealth of Israel, we talk about the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom or the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. What happens is the essentially the whole country rebels against Solomon's son, against uh, King Shlomo's son, whose name is Rechavam, and 10 tribes abandon him and form their own kingdom. One tribe stays, his own tribe of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. And Judah and Benjamin often link together. Benjamin in many ways relies on the tribe of Judah. So you have the kingdom of Judah, which really just the tribe of Judah and Benjamin, which is known as the southern kingdom. It's basically, if you imagine the map of Israel, it's basically everything like Jerusalem or just due north of Jerusalem, south. And as we all know, most of that land is the Negev, is the desert, is not inhabitable. So it's a very small, indefensible country. And that's where the kingdom of Solomon's family lies, the kingdom of Judah, the house of David. And that's what we call the southern kingdom. Now, even though they don't have land, they don't have numbers, they don't have uh, in natural prosperity. They do have one thing that the northern kingdom does not have, and that is the base Hamidash. They have the temple, and we're going to see how that plays in to their hands in a moment. One of the great criticizers or critics of King Solomon was somebody by the name of Yeruvam ben Nevat. And Yeruvam ben Nevat actually becomes the first king of Israel, the king of the northern kingdom. He perpetuates the civil war. He perpetuates the split. And he brings the majority of tribes, the 10 tribes, up to the northern areas and makes it the kingdom of Israel. Again, the nation was called Israel. But when you have 10 out of 12 tribes, you get the name. So even though Rechavim has the temple, the southern kingdom has Jerusalem, they don't have the majority. So the name goes to the majority. That becomes Israel. And our two kingdoms now, which we'll, we'll touch on very much this week and next week, are known as Yehuda in the south and Israel, Yisrael in the north. Now, because the only thing that Judah has going for it, that Yehuda has going for it, is that they have the temple, that ends up making a slight issue for Yeruvim ben Nevat, for the king of the northern kingdom, the king of Israel. And why is that? Because... In the Torah, we have an obligation, even if we do not live in Jerusalem, when the temple stood, we had the obligation to visit the temple thrice yearly, three times a year. We had to visit the temple for the three pilgrimage festivals, hence visit, make a pilgrimage, and we went for Sukkot, Pesach, and Shavuos. And there is a law in the temple that in the temple, no one is allowed to sit except for the king from the house of David. In Yeshiva Bazar, El Machus Beis David Bilvad, that there's no sitting in the temple courtyard except for the king from the house of David. So this presented a conundrum for Yeruvim because, you know, they were nice religious Jews. They still want to go to the temple, even though it was now in technically a different country, but they still want to go to the temple for the pilgrimage festivals. And the people wanted to go. And Yeruvim knew if the people went, then he had to go because he's their king. And they would walk into the temple courtyard and they would see everybody standing, including Yeruvim, and and Rechavim, his competitor from the south, the son of Solomon, who would be sitting. And like, how would that look for things? Here, he thinks he's the main king, and uh, he thinks that the, the kingdom of the south is nothing. It's going to fade away, and he's going to be in charge of everything. And they walk in, and they see Rechavim sitting there. Well, that didn't work for Yeruvim. So Yeruvim says, you know what? We're going to make a new law up here in the north. We're going to have a pilgrimage festival too, but we're not going to go to the temple in Judah because that's a different country. We're going to make our own temple in Shomron and Samaria, and that's going to be our temple. And by the way, not only that, even if you want to go to the temple in Jerusalem, you're not allowed to go, right? We're not, we're not driving to Jerusalem. No one can go, but you're allowed to go to my temple in Shomron. And he put sentries on the streets from Yisrael to, Ju to Yehuda, and anybody who tried to cross it was punishable by death. It was the original Berlin Wall. No one could go from the northern kingdom down to the southern kingdom. And as promised, he makes a temple in the north to so that they can have a temple. But, you know, he, on the surface, he wasn't so smart in his construction, because as opposed to just making a replica of the temple in Jerusalem, he makes a little bit of a, mis a mistake, and he puts a central focal point in the temple in Shomron, and th that central focal point is a golden calf. Now, you might think that by now, like someone like Yeruvim, we're, we're told he was a big scholar, he probably knew a little bit of Jewish history, he probably knew the golden calves and Jews like didn't get along so well. It, 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 it hadn't worked out so well with it when the Jews got involved with these golden calves. So like, what was Yeruvim thinking that he makes this temple with a golden calf in it? The answer quite simply is like this. 
if we, and we're not going to delve into it too much now, but if we look into the golden calf, the golden calf was not out and out idol worship. It was that they were trying to replace Moshe. It was, it was a, a new focal point for the Jewish people, representative of the fact that the calf represents the weak side of the Almighty, the weak side of Hashem, and the, and the uh, lion represents the strong side. So Moshe was the lion. They thought Moshe was gone, so they want something to represent the weak side. They thought, okay, now we're entering a weak time between the relationship between God and the Jewish people. And Yerolam was saying the same thing. He said, it's no open miracles. We're not going to have the temple like in Jerusalem, so we're going to have the weak side of Hashem represented by a calf. Okay, it was still bad, bad plan, but this is what he does. He makes a temple to Hashem. They're, they're, they're focused on Hashem, but Entity puts a golden calf. And through this, he leads the people into idol worship. Because even though that, uh, that calf was supposed to be a middleman, if you will, a middle person, a middle idol, or a middle statue between the Jewish people of the North and the Almighty. Before too long, people started worshiping that golden calf, and Yeruvim, therefore, has much blood on his hands, so to speak. He is the one who is considered guilty for splitting the kingdom, for keeping the kingdom split, because even though initially the split is sanctioned by the Almighty, it was only supposed to be a temporary split, and we see that Yeruvim, by putting up the Berlin Wall tries to make it a permanent split. And by putting these temples with the golden calves, he lunges the people into idol worship. And that essentially is the situation for the Northern Kingdom for the whole roughly 300 years that it exists. Because there are going to be numerous kings of, of the Northern Kingdom, about 20 in total, and one is worse than the next. One is, you know, they, they all, or, or many of them, start with a policy of reconciliation. They're going to bring the kingdom back together, and they're going to stay true to Hashem. But we're going to see that not one of them ends in a righteous state. And Yerobam sets the path for that, and that's really the culture of the Northern Kingdom. Fast forward now to a king by the name of Ela, who is the king of the northern kingdom in 751 before the common era. Ela is killed by one of his servants, whose name is Zimri, and, uh, and he proclaims himself king subsequently. The people don't like that. They don't want a servant ruling them. They don't like that he kills their king. So the people demand that Omri, who is a general of the army, become the king of Israel. So Omri takes over the kingdom. He kills Zemri. Now we have Omri, who is the king of Israel. And Omri just perpetuates the uh, policies and the ways of Yeruvim ben Nevat. The country stays completely separate. It's steeped in the worship of these golden calves at the temple in Shamron. And Omri is another terrible king of the country of Israel. Now, when Omri dies, he's one of the few kings of Israel to actually die in his bed. Uh, when Omri dies, his son Ahab takes over in roughly the year 740 before the common era. Now, Ahab is going to be similar to many of the kings that came before him. We wouldn't call them completely evil at their core. Uh, they're pretty bad. I mean, Yeruvim ben Nevat, we're told, doesn't have a place in the world to come. One of the few people doesn't have a place in the world to come. And they do, or they're involved in this idol worship. But the idol worship, let's say, we'll call it it's a Jewish idol worship, right? They're, they're worshiping this calf. They look at it as an intermedi intermediary between themselves and God. And that's how far the people have gone at this point. Again, not good, but we're going to see it gets a lot more terrible. And that is perpetuated by Ahab. Now, the Book of Kings tells us that Ahab is the worst of the kings up until that point. He's the eighth king of Israel, and he's the worst of the worst. The seven before him were bad. He tops them all as the worst of the worst. Now, why is he considered the worst of the worst? Because as we said, all the other kings, we, said, we explained what they did. Ahab says, this calf, this idol, so to speak, and the temple, that's not enough for me. I want to do some like real hardcore idol worship. And what he does is he goes, is he goes to he goes to find himself a wife from the uh, from the kingdom of Sidon. Sidon is a uh, it's actually today a city in Lebanon. It's on the uh, coast, the Mediterranean coast of I'm sorry, the um, the um, 
yeah, the, sorry, the Mediterranean coast of Lebanon. It's about 60 kilometers due north of the uh, Lebanese-Israeli border. And uh, so it was a neighboring country to the north of Israel in those days. It's actually interesting. I wanted to see exactly how far, um, exactly how far Sidon, the city today, is from Shomron. So I Googled it, Google Maps, and Google Maps told me it's 500 kilometers away. Now, if you know anything about the metric system, how can it be 60 kilometers from the border of Israel, but 500 kilometers from Shomron? Well, that's because Google Maps only tells you a route that you could get there. And if you wanted to get from Lebanon or, or Sidon to Shomron, you would have to go Lebanon, Syria, down to Jordan, and then come in through the, uh, through the um, you know, through the... Um, through the bridge between Jordan and, uh, and Israel, because that is an open border. So anyways, uh, the Allenby Bridge over there. But uh, it doesn't matter, it's, it's a lot closer than that. So you, so Acha wants to do some real idol worship. It's not enough to do this Jewish idol worship. He wants to do the real thing. And he goes and finds himself a queen from the country of Sidon. He marries the daughter of the king of Sidon. His name is Esbal. Uh, which means which which means the, the the king of Baal, the king who worshipped the idol of Baal. Baal was one of the main idols and, at that time, and he marries his daughter, who is none other than Jezebel. Than Jezebel. Now, if you know modern Hebrew, you might hear that name and say Jezebel. That sounds like Zevel, right? Because in modern Hebrew, Zevel is the word for trash. That's, that's a modern Hebrew word. That's not a, uh, a ancient Hebrew word. And her name probably comes more from the word zvul, which means to be lifted up because she was lifting up uh, uh, sacrifices to idols throughout her whole life. So Ahav marries Jezebel. And this, we're going to see, throws the, Jew, the kingdom of Israel into a terrible, terrible state. Now, let's, let's assess this marriage for a minute. First of all, it was quite similar to the many marriages that Shlomo HaMelech had, the King Solomon had, and that in many ways it was political. Sidon was an ally to the north, so therefore, through the military and political alliance, Ahab takes the daughter of Eshbal, of Eshbal, the king of Sidon, and that is, that is why they get married. Now, the big question that is asked on Yuzevel and that is debated by our commentaries is, we mentioned by all of Solomon's wives that he converted all of them. Now, it didn't work so well because many of them resorted back to the Avodah Zarah, to the idol worship after they came into Israel. But the question was, did Jezebel convert? Was Jezebel Jewish or did she stay a Sidoni, a, a worshiper of Baal? We know she said a worshiper of Baal, but did she ever actually convert to Judaism? And that is a big question mark in the, amongst the commentators. Majority opinion, and what would seem as clear from the verses, is she never converted. This lady from day one doesn't show one Jewish value, is very involved in, in, in the worship of Baal, of the idol of Baal, and, and she's an out-and-out non-Jew, and we, therefore we have our first king of Israel who intermarries, who marries a non-Jew. And that's really the predominant opinion of many of the commentators. The problem is, and we'll go into this a little bit more next week, is according to most opinions, Asalia, Atalia, who we'll talk about next week, is the daughter of Jezebel and Ahav, and she becomes the queen of Judah. We'll talk about how that happened next week. And therefore, she marries into the house of David, which would mean the descendants of the house of David are the descendants of Asalia and the descendants of Jezebel. And therefore, do your math. If Jezebel is, in fact, not Jewish, that would mean that the Messiah is not Jewish, right? I guess that's good for the Christians, I guess, but no, right? It would mean that the Mashiach, the David, the lineage of David is not Jewish because it's, it becomes intermarried through Asalia, through the daughter of Jezebel. Jezebel's not Jewish, her daughter's not Jewish, and all her children are not Jewish, and therefore the house of David is no longer Jewish. So that is the great difficulty to say Jezebel never actually converted to Judaism. Therefore, according to that, take, if you will, Jezebel for sure converted, like Solomon's wives, just like did in an insincere way, and therefore we are able to protect the lineage somewhat. There are others, others who we'll see next week say that Asalia was not actually the daughter of Jezebel, and we'll touch on that more next week. But be it as it may, that's where the difficulty comes to as to whether or not Jezebel is actually Jewish or not. 
the the simple understanding, majority opinion, reading most of the commentaries would lead us to say she's not Jewish, but that raises a whole slew of other problems that we'll go into next week if we were to say she is not Jewish. So, okay, we'll leave her as Jewish question mark. We don't know exactly if she converted or not, but one thing is for sure. She is the first one to bring foreign idols into Israel because up until this point, they were just worshiping the Jewish idols, right? This golden calf. But now she brings in the foreign idols. She brings in the, the priests of Baal, the priests of Asherah, and they become like the court priests. The commentary, I'm sorry, the Book of Kings tells they're eating by her table. They're living in her palace. This becomes now the national religion. No more worshiping the golden calf as an intermediary between the God of Israel. It's now worshiping the Baal and the Asherah, and that is the national religion. And it spreads throughout the whole kingdom of Israel. And it's really through Jezebel, through Jezebel. She is the one who is granted the, the, uh, the accolade of having spread idol worship throughout the whole country of Israel. Now, it's interesting. When we talk about Ahav being the worst of the worst, being the worst king up until that point, what's so bad, says the prophet? He married Jezebel. In other words, Ahav on his own might have been no worse than Yeruvim and, and, and Basha and all the ones who came before him and Omri and Zimri and all these ones who came before him. He might have been no worse than them. They were bad, but not terrible. What makes Ahav terrible? He marries Jezebel. And Jezebel is the one who essentially wears the pants from that point on in the kingdom. As a matter of fact, the, the Medrash tells us that Jezebel is one of the regent queens, is one of the queens of Israel who actually ruled Israel. So even though it seems that Ahav function as a king, it was almost more like the British Empire today, that the monarch for most of this time was really Jezebel, and Ahab was just the, uh, whatever, what, what do they call um, uh, 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 Queen Elizabeth's husband? Um, he's the, the uh, whatever. So, Joan, I know you're trying to say you're muted there. The, the consort. The consort, right. So, 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 uh, so, so Ahab would just be the consort. Jezebel is our queen, therefore our topic for tonight. Now, there's a big question that we have to ask. But the times were so religiously terrible, and the Jewish people in Israel, in the Northern Kingdom, were thrown so far from the Jewish tradition. How is it that seemingly they had some success? We see they're going to have some military success. We see they're going to have some prosperity. We see they're going to they're going to have some peace to a certain extent. How can that be if they are such a terrible kingdom? How are they How are they worthy of that? So our sages tell us two reasons that, uh, that Ahab had a certain merit to his kingdom. One was that even though the, they were terribly, terribly involved in idol worship, they did not speak Lashon Hara. They did not speak slander one person to another. And we're going to see in a moment when, uh, when Elio and Navi, when the, project, when the prophet Elijah comes in, how he is somewhat protected. He's able to hide out because people won't, won't rat on him because people did, did not speak Lashon Hara. And beyond that, we see that even even though he was knee deep in the idol worship that his wife had brought into the kingdom, he had a certain amount of respect for the Torah. And because he had a certain amount of respect for the Torah, he was able to rule for 40 years. The Torah was given in 40 days. He was able to rule for 40 years. But again, how do we reconcile this point? How do we reconcile this point that like we're saying it's the worst kingdom, state religion's ball, Yet they don't speak Lush and Hara, they honor Torah to a certain extent. And just to make things really wonky, I'll tell you what happens next. What happens is enters our most famous prophet of all of Jewish history, Eliyahu Hanavi, after Moshe, I guess, right? Elijah the prophet. And he is given the task to try and rectify this spiritual situation in the kingdom of Israel with Ahab and Jezebel on the throne. And what does he do? You know, Elio was always one who just held no punches. He proclaims a drought. Now, it was a very prosperous time, but he stops that prosperity and proclaims a drought, and there's no rain for three years, and again, it's an agrarian society that is a terrible situation. People are starving. Crops aren't happening. It is a terrible situation for three years. He attempts to bring the Jewish people in Israel, Ahab, Jezebel, all to their knees to try and make them realize that they have got to turn it around and, and you know, get their act together. Now, we're told that while Eliyahu is hiding, he's hiding in a cave in Beersheba, and it's interesting because you, 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 you might ask the question, if he defected to Judah, the southern kingdom, why does he have to hide? 
And the answer, like we'll go into more next week, is that Jezebel and Ahab's reach was not only in Israel, but it was in Judah as well. So it was affecting the whole 12 tribes at this point, the whole, both kingdoms of Israel. So Elijah's hiding in a, in a cave, and we're told that while he is hiding, and not only that, but Avadia, who is the servant of Ahab, ends up becoming a prophet, ends up converting to Judaism and becomes a prophet, hides out a hundred other prophets away from Ahab and Jezebel because they were going to kill every prophet. And all of these prophets are sustained, how? By birds who would bring them food from the palace of Ahab. So Eliyahu Hanavi, the prophet Elijah, is sustained in hiding by food from the palace of of Ahab and Jezebel, right? He eats Jezebel's cholent on Shabbos. That's what he's surviving on, which, 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 is, which is crazy. Like how in the world does the great prophet, the great rabbi, the great sage, whatever you want to call him, Elio and Navi, how in the world does he eat from the table of Ahab and Jezebel? I mean, <laughs> what, what did they eat already? Pig, shrimp, like they were like they were knee deep in the Zara. They probably ate trafus, trafus galore, like McDonald's every night. Like, how could Elio and Navi eat from their palace? The answer is because even though Baal was the state religion, it wasn't just Baal. They would go to the temple of Baal on Sunday, but go to Shul on Shabbos. They would get up and put on tefillin and then go bring their sacrifice to Baal. It was Jews for Getchkalach. It was Jews for idols over here. They still in many ways practiced Judaism, but mixed in the worship of these foreign idols. It was all like Jews for Jesus. It was a whole new religion. So here you had it in the camp, glad kosher, enough that Elio and Navi would be comfortable eating from their table, yet they threw the kingdom into rampant, deep idol worship. And that was the time period. And that was the time period. It was, it was a new religion. It, was, it wasn't just Baal. It was a mixture of Baal and Judaism and, and honor for Torah, but worshiping the Baal and crazy time period. But this is the situation at hand when Elio proclaims the drought. Three years, he stays in hiding. And finally, it's time for the great showdown. The Almighty says, Elijah, enough's enough. Let's, let's bring this to a head and see if the Jewish people are ready to turn things around. Okay, I'm going to pause at this point for questions and uh, see if anything has been completely unclear. Find out if I've totally lost you guys or, uh, or you know, where we're holding here. So any questions at this point about anything we've covered, anything we've said, any other thoughts that might be sparked by something we said? No? Okay, let me check the chat box. Nothing in the chat box. Uh, YouTube, I wouldn't see it if they posted it. If you're watching on YouTube, please come over here and or, or email me your questions. But uh, okay, I'll assume we're clear at this point and we will keep going. So the Almighty says, Elijah, it's time to bring this to a head. Enough's enough. End the drought and, and let's figure out what's going on. And one day, Elio comes out of his cave and he meets up with soon to be prophet Avadia, at this point servant to Ahav, and he says, Avadia, I want to have a showdown with your king. And Avadia says, Elijah, I know how you work. I'm not going to go tell Ahab to meet you because I know what's going to happen. You're going to tell Ahab to meet you. He's going to come here to meet you. You're not going to be here. I'm going to get killed. And you're going to laugh at me. I'm not doing this. Elio says, you have my word. Go get your king, Ahab. I want to talk to him. And finally, the two meet. And you see they have this, this great, uh, great shouting match, if you will, that Ahab says, oh, there's the Eicher Yisrael, there's the troubler of the Jewish people. To which Eliyahu responds, you think I'm the troubler of the Jewish people? Look in the mirror, buddy, because you're the troubler of the Jewish people. To which Ahab says, no, you're the troubler of the Jewish people. No, you're the troubler. No, you're the troubler. This was back and forth for about three or four days. And finally, Elijah says, okay, okay, okay. This is not getting anywhere. Therefore, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to challenge you to a duel. Now, this was not a duel like in the times of Alexander Hamilton and Aaron Burr. This was a duel of spirituality. Because what does Elio say? He says to Ahab, I want you to bring the 450 priests of the Baal and 400 priests of the Asherah tree, another sect of idol worship that was prevalent in the country at the time, and we're going to have a big showdown. Now, what's interesting is when the duel happens, only the 450 priests of Baal come, and the 400 priests of Asherah don't come. Why? 
because we're told that the 450 priests of Baal, that was like, uh, that was Ahab's cohort. And the 400 priests of Asherah, that was Jezebel's cohort. So she protected her cohort. She says, I'm not sending them. In other words, she cared so little about the Jewish people. She cared so much for her idol worship that she said, let the Jewish people starve to death. I'm keeping my priests under protection. You can send your priest. So fine. The 450 priests of Baal come on that great day at Mount Carmel, of Har Carmel, later made a great winery and some good wine. And Elio draws up the rules of the duel. First off, he calls out to the Jewish people. He says, guys, this is for you. And he says the faithful words, Ad moschai atem poschim ifim. Until when are you going to straddle the fence? Because as we explained, they weren't just worshiping Baal straight out. It was Jews for Baal. It was both together. Im Hashem alukim, if Hashem's your God, l'chul acharab, follow Hashem. The im ha-Baal, and if you... Believe that Baal is your God? Follow him. Stop straddling the fence, which is a fundamental Jewish thing over here. That, that we hear from the words of Eliyahu and his charge to the Jewish people that it is worse. It is worse to straddle the fence. It is worse to practice Judaism mixed in with some other uh, foreign idol worship or foreign culture. That is worse than just worshiping the idol straight out. In other words, it's worse to bastardize Judaism than just to abandon it altogether. So he says to the Jewish people, stop bastardizing it. Stop, cr- stop making it totally messed up. If you want to be Jewish, follow God. If you want to be an idol worshiper, follow Baal. But stop straddling the fence. And the Jewish people completely ignored him. So he said, okay, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give the priests of Baal a home field advantage. They can win the toss and go first. We're going to bring some wood. We're going to bring two bulls. You can take as much time as you want to prepare those bulls for sacrifice. You can take as much time as you want to set up the wood. But there's only one caveat. No fire allowed. And if your God of Baal is for real, then a fire will come down from heaven and consume your two bulls. And then if my God is the God, then the fire will come down and consume my bulls. So fine. Elio lets them go first. They win the toss. They prepare their bulls. They start to try and, uh, you know, call out to the Baal and, and, and worship the Baal and pray to Baal and nothing's happening. Nothing doing. Our sages tell us they even snuck in some fire. They rigged the whole situation. They could sneak in some fire. That didn't work. It gets to be close to noontime, and Elio and his classical sensitivity starts taunting them. He says, maybe it's not working because you're not being loud enough. Maybe you got to yell a little bit louder. Maybe your God is, I don't know, having a conversation with someone, therefore he can't answer you. Maybe he's out pursuing his enemies. Maybe he's in the bathroom. Maybe he's sleeping. Right? A great taunt of world history. And the priests of Baal go even crazier, and they start cutting themselves, and blood is gushing everywhere. Nothing doing. High noon pass. They lost their opportunity. At which point, Elio looks at the situation. He says, okay, guys, my turn now. And he tells the people to bring four jugs of water and to dump it on his wood. And then he tells them to do it again and again. And he totally soaks the area where he's going to bring a sacrifice, totally soaks the wood. At which point he says, Jewish people, it's time to pay attention. And he says three words, Aneni, Hashem, Aneni, which means answer me, Hashem, answer me. At which point a fire comes down from heaven, consumes his two bulls, the whole Jewish people looking on say, Hashem hu Elohim, Hashem hu Elohim, Hashem is our God, Hashem is our God, and Elio proceeds to chase after the priests of Baal because by this point they were running and he slaughters all 450 of them. And it's a beautiful scene. The Jewish people come back in mass mass, uh, mass, uh, repentance to God. And it's just, it's a beautiful sign of the power of the Almighty and the power of his prophet, Eliyahu. Ahab is witnessing this whole thing, runs back to the palace. Of course, Jezebel doesn't come. And he says, Queen, you'll never believe what happened. He describes the whole situation and, and everything and the taunts of Elio and the water and the fire and the, all the 450 priests of Baal are gone. And Jezebel says, that's great. Elio, great show. Beautiful. Love what you did with the fire. 
that taunting the priest, beautiful water trick, never seen anything like it before. I give you a 9.8 and I'm gonna kill you tomorrow. What? What are you gonna kill me tomorrow? The whole Jewish people just said, Hashem Elohim. They said they believe in God. They said they believe in me as a prophet. They don't believe in you guys anymore. They're done with you guys. What are you gonna kill me tomorrow? You know why? Because tomorrow it's all going to wear off. They're going to have forgotten about you and the mountain of Carmel and the water and the fire and the tundra. They're going to have forgotten about everything. So we'll kill you tomorrow. The Jewish people are not with you. To which Elio says, you know what? You're right. You win. And he runs away and he lays down to die. At which point the Almighty comes to him. He says, Elio, or he sends an angel first. He says, Elio, get up. Eat something. And come and walk with me. And he takes them on a walk. It takes them a total of 40 days. And they travel to Mount Sinai. And when they're at Mount Sinai, God brings a big tornado, wind. Everything's ripped up by this wind that comes in. And he says to Eli, well, Eli, you like that? He says, yeah, that's cool. He says, God's not in wind. And then God brings a big earthquake. And the whole world opens up and everything, big earthquake. Things are falling in. It's amazing. And God says, oh, you like that? He says, that's amazing. He said, God's not in earthquakes. And then he brings a big fire and everything else is just consumed up in flames and smoke and nothing's left. God says, you like that? And he says, that's great. He says, God is not in fire. He says, you know where you find me? You don't find me in the wind. You don't find me in the earthquake. You don't find me in the fire. You find me in Kol de Mama Daka. You find me in that quiet, consistent, voice. That's where you connect to the Almighty. You think you're going to win over the Jewish people by making this big miracle of wind, fire, pump, circumstances, everything? No, that's not how you win over the Jewish people. You win over the Jewish people with a quiet, soft whisper. Kol de mama daka. You speak their language time and time, consistency. That's how you win over the Jewish people. It's not done with big miracles and pomp and circumstance. It's done over time with consideration, with a calm demeanor, and with that consistency. And that's why we see from here, and I have another lecture some of you might heard that, that, we, uh, that we call, do you believe in miracles? I don't, because we see from here, the Almighty is expressing why miracles don't work. But what works is that consistency, that day in, day out. And that's what Elio, that's the message that Elio takes from the Almighty. There's a famous medrash, which I've quoted plenty of times, and many of you might have heard it from me before, that asks, what is the verse, what is the pasuk that summarizes the whole entire Torah? And there's three options given. One is Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad, Hear, O Israel, Lord is our God, the Lord is one. One is V'yachatza L'recha Kimocha, Love your neighbor as yourself. And the third one is Esa Kebes Hachad Tasev Avoker, Esa Kebes Hasheni Tasev B'Bein Arbayim. They, you bring in the temple and they brought their daily offering. They brought one sheep in the morning and one sheep in the afternoon. Concludes the Medrash. That verse is the one that summarizes what it means to be a Jew. Why? Like Shema Yisrael and love your neighbors yourself. That loses out to bring one sheep in the morning and one sheep in the afternoon. The sacrifice, the daily sacrifice in the temple, that summarizes what it means to be a Jew? The answer is yes. And that's the message the Almighty was giving to Elio and Navi. You don't you don't influence the Jewish people with big miracles. It's that consistency. One sheep in the morning, one sheep in the afternoon. Morning, afternoon, evening. Consistency. That's how you have an influence on the Jewish people. And the Almighty chastises Elijah a little bit more. He says, Elio, you give up too easily on my people. I'm going to prove to you how wrong you are. Because you now have a job. Your job as a prophet is over. But you have a job that throughout history, when the Jewish people are flexing their muscles of our relationship, when they're showing the relationship that they have with me, you are going to be there to witness it. Every time they bring a baby boy into the covenant of Abraham, into the bris of Abraham, you're going to be there to witness it. We're going to set a chair for you. And when the Jewish people celebrate their taking as my nation, our wedding, so to speak, you're going to be there to witness it. That's the Passover Seder. And not only that, when all this comes to its fruition and comes to its conclusion, and I bring Mashiach and we're able to rebuild the temple and bring the world to its perfection, you're going to be the one to announce it. You're going to be the one to herald it in, eating a big piece of humble pie, saying, I was wrong. There's no giving up on the Jewish people. And that's the job that Elio Navi has in history. 
So what happens next? Elio's not a prophet anymore. His disciple, Elisha, takes over. And in his last task, he anoints the king, Yehu. Now, it's going to be a little while before Yehu takes over, but Yehu is given a very specific job, and that is to wipe out the house of Ahav. But before we can do it, the prophet wants to make it completely clear to us what type of person we are dealing with in Ezebel and Jezebel. And this happens through a story that there is a man by the name of Novos, and Novos has a vineyard. And Ahav, for whatever reason, wants that vineyard. Now, according to our sages, Novos is actually Ahav's nephew. So the Mishpacha, right? It's a fight for the family. He wants the vineyard. The king approaches Novos, tries to buy the vineyard. Novos says, I ain't selling. I don't want to give you the vineyard. Which, again, you can ask the question, like, this is the king. Like, when they're like, eminent domain, didn't he have to listen to the king? Wasn't he worried for his life? Be it as it may, Novos, uh, Novos is... Uh, uh, a rebuttal and not willing to sell his vineyard to the king. It somehow works for the king. The king's all upset. He's depressed. He goes home. And when he gets home that night, Isabel, Jezebel says, what's wrong? What's, what, what's with the sour face? He says, well, you know, I wanted Novelis' vineyard, but he wouldn't sell it to me. She says, ha, dude, put your pants on. You're the king over here. I'll make sure you get the field. You'll get the vineyard of Novos. And she takes Ahav signet ring and she writes letters and she writes uh, proclamations in the name of Ahav that basically that that Novos should be killed and the and the vineyard should become the vineyard of the king. And when Ahav hears about this, he's very upset because he realizes the innocent, the blood of an innocent man was shed. But again, that's who Jezebel is. She cares about no one. She cares about nothing. She doesn't care about the Jewish people. She doesn't care about one thing at all. And then we're told about her demise. What is the end of Jezebel? Eventually, Yehu gets the upper hand, and he fulfills his task to wipe out the whole house of Ahav, all the descendants, everywhere, wherever they were. As we mentioned, they're already far into the kingdom of Judah. He wipes them out down there. He wipes them out throughout Israel. He takes care of every single one of them. Ahav actually dies in a war, and then he comes for Jezebel. And what happens, again, in her, in her wonderful demeanor, she puts on makeup and fancy jewelry and fancy clothes and waits on the balcony for Yehu to come. Now, our sages debate exactly what she was doing. According to one opinion, she was just taunting him, right? She was taunting him that, you know, you, you, I'm the queen over here. You think you're going to mess with me? Another opinion is that she knew she was going to her death, but there's a concept of, you know, if you're going to go out to, if, when, when royalty is killed, they dress up for it. And then a third opinion altogether, she was trying to seduce him. She was hoping that if she could seduce him, her life would be spared. Be it as it may, it doesn't work if that was her if that was her motive or if there's a mixture of the three. And Yehu gives the command that she should be pushed out the window. She is pushed out the window, and her body is left to be devoured by dogs. And finally, when it comes time to bury her, all they can find of her body is left is her head and her hands. And our sages tell us because the only reason why those parts of her body were worthy of being buried was because she would often uh, clap for brides and she would nod her head in, in, uh, in happiness when she heard about a wedding. And she would also clap in a mourning fashion when she would hear a eulogy. So, so, so because with her hands in her head, she showed some slightly good character traits. Therefore, her hands and her head were worthy of proper burial, and the rest of her body was completely consumed by dogs. But in this time period of her being the regent and her husband ruling for roughly 40 years, they throw the kingdom deep into a Vodazara, deep into idol worship to the point where it will never return. Even though Yehu, we're going to see he messes up in the end as well, but he's the closest that Israel has to a good king because he's able to initially get rid of Baal and get rid of Asherah and get rid of all these idols, but they just resort back to the golden calf and the temple and that old situation, and he goes in the ways of Yerov and Benavat, and at this point, it's going to be too far gone for the northern kingdom. It's going to take about 100 years to play out, but eventually the northern kingdom is going to be completely destroyed. If you've ever heard about the concept of the 10 lost tribes, that's because eventually they get wiped out by the kingdom, a combination of Aram and Assyria, and they are dispersed throughout the Assyrian Empire. They're gone within two generations, and they are completely wiped out. So we talk about the 10 lost tribes of Israel. The beginning of the end of that was done by our friend Jezebel, and at the end, they are completely gone from the map of history. Now, two questions can be asked on that. Number one is, 
We talk about in the messianic era that all 12 tribes are going to be, or all 12 tribes are going to be reinstated. So how can the all 12 tribes be reinstated if 10 out of 12 were completely wiped out? Well, the answer is twofold. Number one is that we know that certain members of those 10 tribes will defect to the south before the north is wiped out. And so mixed into Judah and Benjamin, there's remnants of all 10 of the other tribes. And number two, we're told the prophet Jeremiah, after the destruction of the first temple, he goes throughout the Assyrian Empire, which is now the Babylonian Empire, and collects any remnants he can find of the 10 lost tribes. So we're told that there's at least remnants of the 10 tribes left within the Jewish people, but we're called the Jewish people. We're called Jews, Judah, Yehuda, because that's essentially where we come from. Because even if we come from one, one of those remnants of the 10 tribes, we don't know it unless we're a Kohen or Levi, we assume we're from the tribe of Judah, and therefore we simply call ourselves Jews. The last thing we'll say about Jezebel is we see in her the ultimate lesson. Either it's, it's like the sages said, that she was a regent straight out, that she was a ruling queen, or we see that the fateful words of Shlomo HaMelech, of Chachmas Nashem Ben Sabesa, that the wisdom of the woman is what builds the house, that even though Acha wasn't nearly as bad as Jezebel, because Jezebel was the woman, the woman's wisdom, the woman's mind, the woman's will always rules the house. And that's how we say it in Hebrew, Chachmas Nashem Ben Sabesa. And the way we say this in Greek is that the man is the head of the household, but the woman is the neck of the household, and the neck can turn the head any way she wants. And we see that very much by Izevo. We see that very much by Jezebel, that she definitely set the tone for the kingdom, so much so that she, prop she propels it to the point where it'll eventually be destroyed and wiped out of the map and from the face of history. And that's the story of our Queen Jezebel. Next week, we'll continue with Asalia, with Atalia, who is, like we said, probably her daughter. But we're going to see really how far this influence or this negative influence of Jezebel goes and how it not only leads to the destruction of the kingdom of Israel, but it almost leads to the destruction of the kingdom of Judah as well. And we'll, co and we'll cover that next week. And Atalia, the, usurp the usurper queen, next week, 8 p.m., right here in Rabbi Landis' Zoom room. I thank you all for coming. I thank you for attending. Questions, comments, concerns, good jokes. First of all, I see Steve is here now. So Steve, by the way, we start off by wishing you a happy 70th birthday, but now we can do it with you here. Very, very happy 70th birthday. Very, very exciting. You've, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's, uh, it's been a pleasure to know you for like seven of those years, for like one tenth of those 70 years, but we wish you many, many more until 120 with health and happiness and uh, I'm glad that to celebrate the day after your birthday you were you came into the class so happy happy birthday to Steve happy birthday, I'm Steve. seeing a, a big round of happy birthday no I'm just kidding um, <laughs> happy birthday questions comments concerns anybody Bueller I have a, I have a question go for it Joanne so you said that um, Elijah killed the 450 priests of Baal mm-hmm so how does that mesh with thou shalt not kill? And that he's still, you know, that he's still a prophet and he's still assumingly a righteous person. I mean, I guess he's righteous because he killed people who were leading the Jews in the wrong way, but it's still killing people. Excellent. Excellent question. Still killing people. And as a, as a congregant of mine in Cincinnati would always point out uh, the, there's no commandment in the Torah not to kill. Doesn't exist. The commandment is lo tirzach, or lo tirzach, which means don't murder, right? There's no commandment not to kill. The proof is the Torah tells us that there, is, that, that there are different types of warfare, different types of wars that have, have to happen. And the Torah gives us commandments to kill many a times. Like a Malik, we have to kill off the nation of Malik. And by the way, worshippers of idols, especially what we call Macy's and Madiach, people who spread idol worship uh, throughout the Jewish people, also is a commandment to kill them. So there's no such thing as a commandment not to kill. There's many commandments to kill, as we said, right? Or as, or as we just read in Kohel, it's a time to kill and time to be born. And uh, but there's not you may not murder, which means killing for no cause. Over here, Elia had cause. He was trying to save the Jewish people. He was trying to he was wiping out the priests. Um, the, the interesting question you can ask though and we can ask the same question about Hanukkah is that Eliyahu is a Kohen and by Hanukkah the Hashemunayim the Hasmoneans are Kohanim 
And that raises a whole different problem because a Kohen that kills, even if, uh, even if it's justified, even if it is legitimate, a legitimate killing, which they were fighting wars, it was legitimate, they cannot pr uh, perform the service in the temple. Now, Elio did not perform the service in the temple, but the Hasmoneans, the Maccabees, did. It's a big question how they were allowed to if they actually were, were involved in killing. Uh, you know, maybe it's different because, you know, maybe they're killing non-Jews, maybe not. It's, you know, we, we talk about the Misyavnim, the, the Hellenized Jews. That were, you know, very complicated. We'll get to when we talk about, uh, we're going to talk about the Maccabees with uh, some of our Maccabean queens coming up. But a uh, big question there is, 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 a, is a priest, you cannot kill even if it's justified. So, you know. And, and by the way, we also see this by, uh, by Pinchas, right? That Pinchas we see also killed, right? He kills Zimri and Cosby. But that's a simple answer. He wasn't a priest then, right? He doesn't become a priest until he doesn't become a Kohen until after he kills. It's part of his reward. So the good question, uh, as far as that goes, that it's, as, as a Jew, there was no problem. But as a, as a priest, as a Kohen, there was a problem. And, um, and again, the simple answer is, is that at a time period when we're talking about saving the Torah of Hashem, sometimes we have to tear up the Torah. And we see that that applies, uh, you know, it's not to be taken lightly, but does apply here and there throughout Jewish history. And this would be a, um, you know, a situation like that. So excellent question. Excellent question. Um, okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Good jokes. Okay. Uh, keep an eye on your email for the, uh, for the Shabbos Project information. You can always go to ShabbosProjectKli.com. Shabbos Project Kli. We'll put that in the chat box for you. But, uh, but don't worry because we got emails coming out. We got a bunch of social media posts coming out. I think Joanne already posted it today. The registration is open, but the Shabbos project is going to be awesome. We'll just close with a few more words about it, that besides the amazing virtual challah bake experience that Joanne is sharing for us with Heather, who I saw Heather popped in for a few minutes. I don't think she's here anymore. But, um, but uh, the amazing challah experience we're going to have, there's going to be another a number of opportunities to bring Shabbos into your house and to share it with others. So be sure to check out the website for opportunities to send a little taste of Shabbos to somebody else, to bring it into your home. And it's going to be a wonderful, wonderful program. We're very excited about, very excited to be doing it. And I thank you all for coming. I thank you for listening. And we will see you all next week.